Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Israel, from the onset, knew that human tendency was to worship the created rather than the creator. So, a variety of authors and thinkers wrote down some of their thoughts about who God was in an attempt to show the world that they believed ultimately God was the one who was in charge of all things. The one who was there at the beginning, the one who would be there at the end. And in this process, Israel would engage the cultures that they were in and around. Sometimes it was just their neighbors, sometimes they were in exile, living in the midst of a foreign entity with foreign gods. And they had something to say, something to present to the rest of the world. That the God of Israel, who is there from the beginning, is still there. God is with us. My name is Chris Conway. I'm a junior high pastor here at Rose Drive Friends Church. And I have the great privilege of kicking off this summer series that Kent talked about earlier this morning. This idea that God is with us. And we get to look throughout the summer at different stories of different people in the Old Testament. With different backgrounds and different stories. And to see how God broke into those stories and established his presence with them. And what we will realize that their stories are our stories. That God is still here with us even now. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis 1. As we go through this series, if you are the Twittering type, we're going to try and do a little experiment here. If you have Twitter and you have some responses to things that we're talking about, um, possibly some prayer requests or just some thoughts based on what you hear, I encourage you to go ahead and tweet those with the hashtag RDFGodWithUs. We'll start to collect those and kind of go through those and see how people are responding to what's going on. This morning, as you turn to Genesis 1, we're going to look at the creation story and try to figure out what the creation story meant to the original authors. See, here's what tends to happen. In our modern era, when we approach creation, we do so with a certain framework. See, science has demanded of us that we respond to certain types of questions. And so, by and large, if you type in Genesis 1 or creation into Google, you're going to get results that talk about what Genesis has to say about science and how that gets it's put into the mix. And so you get a lot of catchwords put in there. Young, old, earth, evolution. Those things all show up in this conversation. And they're important questions. I just have no desire to address them this morning. <laughs> what I want to do this morning is look at Genesis 1 through the lens of the Israelite community. Through the lens of the people who wrote the story down and used it to explain what they believed about God to the rest of of the societies around them. And I don't want to do this just because it's a fun history exercise or because it's nostalgic, but because the questions that they asked then are the same questions that we are asking now. And there is a huge, rich tradition in Genesis 1 that sometimes gets overshadowed by some of the scientific inquiry of the day. And so let us take a moment this morning to look at what Genesis has said about God and what that has meant to some of its first hearers, and what that can mean for us today. So to help us get in that mindset, I want to tell a story. And I will just be forthright with you. This story is a little odd. So you might question my sanity, but we are going somewhere with this. And so hang with me. The story goes like this. In the beginning, there was stuff. In this stuff was Apsu, the god of the fresh water, and Tiamat, the god of the salt water. And the two waters mingled, and from them came all of the younger gods. If you're trying to read this in Genesis, you're probably going, what translation is he out of right now? This is not Genesis, all right? Hold that there for a reference. This is a different story. And so the younger gods were born into the world. 
And everything was fine for a time, but the younger gods, they were loud, they were clamorous, and Apsu started to become really annoyed with their presence. And so he devised a plan to essentially eradicate them. But Tiamat, the mother, did not desire that her children suffer such a fate. And so she warned them what Apsu was planning. And so the younger gods conspired together and they found a way to trap Apsu and slay him. This is like some kind of bad daytime television show, I know, but we're, we're, we're going through it. All right. Over time, however, Tiamat began to resent the younger gods for slaying her husband. And one god in particular, by the name of Marduk, was the god of the wind. And he was a little bit boisterous. He would spend time and time again playing with the wind, keeping the other gods up at night. Nobody could sleep. And so some of the gods formulated a plan to rouse Tiamat to go to war with Marduk and put him to rest. And so soon it became this gigantic battle of the cosmos. And Tiamat agreed to this plan, raised up what would be her second husband. This is like Larry King or something. I don't know. This is getting crazy. And so, and King would become the military conqueror that would rally Tiamat's forces. And so there became a war. Those who side with Tiamat and the rest of the gods who were fearful for their lives. Who could possibly go against Kingu and his forces and survive? Who could tackle Tiamat and live? They didn't know. But Marduk felt like these foes were no particular threat to him. And so he said, tell you what, I'll take care of this problem for you. I will go to battle. I will slay King Yu. I will divide Tiamat. You just have to make me king over all the cosmos forever and ever. And the rest of the gods, fearing for their lives, readily agreed to this plan. So Marduk set out to tackle King Yu. You're still questioning my sanity. I can see it in your faces. Trust me, this, this is going somewhere. Okay. So Marduk, he goes out into a glorious battle on his chariot, armed and wrapped in terror and fearsomeness. And there he goes to fight King Yu's forces. And general after general is slain until finally King Yu is brought down by Marduk's hand. And then, not to be done, he continues to go to Tiamat. And there he slays Tiamat and divides her gigantic body into two. One part becomes the earth over which many will reside and the other becomes the heavens where the gods will reside. And from there, the gods honor his request, and he, our Marduk is made the king of all the gods. And he sets the remaining gods to be among the stars, the sun, and the moon. And so the Babylonians who first heard this story recognized that these were deities to be worshipped. Those gods who would survive the attack but side with Tiamat, they were made to be slaves for Marduk and all the other gods. But Marduk had compassion on them, and he set them free of their slavery. But this created a problem. There was work to be done and no food to be had. How were the gods supposed to survive in this kind of climate? So Marduk takes the slain body of King U, takes his bones and blood, and from them forms a race known as humanity. As humanity's ill-begotten fate to be the perpetual slaves of the gods, their lives would be guided by these things that resided in the stars and the sun and the moon. And they would be responsible for working in the earth and providing food for the gods. They'd be responsible for offering sacrifices, sometimes of their own flesh and blood, to please these gods who cared not for them. This is a creation story by the name of the Enuma Elish. It was a very popular Babylonian creation story. And during the Babylonian New Year's festival, they would recite this and lift up Marduk as the king of the gods, the one who was worthy of their worship and sacrifices. And they would make all sorts of sacrifices of all kinds to Marduk. Not because Marduk cared at all for who they were, but because they just didn't want to die. <laughs> and so there they were with their story. The Israelites spent a lot of their time in and out of other cultures. They did actually spend some time in exile in Babylon. It's quite possible that the author of Genesis might have been familiar with this specific story. But if it wasn't this particular story, it was others. The Israelites knew that the surrounding Mesopotamian area had their own understanding of what God and the world and people were like. They had stories that explained that. And from these stories, the Israelites realized the kinds of questions people were asking, the kinds of things people people wanted to know. And so the author of Genesis, through the inspiration of God, sits down to write a story, a song, a work of theology, really, to explain precisely how Israel understood the God of the universe. Not simply to offer their creation story against the other creation stories, but to stand up to the myths that they were hearing and say, no, human beings aren't just an afterthought. 
Human beings weren't created simply to please the random whims of gods. The God we serve cannot be matched to any others. He is not engaged in some cosmic struggle with other gods. He is above all of that, above all creation. And through this story, they're able to show the rest of the world what God is truly like. So that's where we're going this morning. Genesis 1. What does it say about God, us, and God being with us? And so let's go ahead and take a look at this idea that Genesis 1 talks about God and says some very important things about who God is. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and see, like, keep in Genesis 1. Just look at the first verse. See how far we can get. In the beginning, God. All right, as far as we get. In the beginning, God. The Israelites understood this, and they understood this well. There wasn't a lot of point in trying to explain how God got there. You won't see in the Old Testament philosophical arguments, five points for why God exists. Those things aren't there. The general framework, the Israelites understood this. If you're going to understand the world, you have to get this. You have to take this as an axiom of the universe. God is there. If you try to prove God's existence too far, you're going to end up trying to figure out where he comes from, just like all these other creation stories that you're hearing in Babylon and anywhere else. That means there's something else before God. There's something else greater than God that God is from. That isn't the God that we serve. And so we don't understand it. We don't get it. But God is there from the beginning. And all things come from him. And so this creates kind of an interesting problem. Because you've got God and then you've got nothing else. And so this is the tension of the story. This right here is where Genesis picks up. What is God going to do with the nothingness, with the emptiness that exists? And you see the author of Genesis trying to wrestle with this idea. If you look in verse 2, this is kind of how he tries to explain the void that was there. He says, now the earth was formless and empty. If you were here last week, Kent taught you some Hebrew words for those. That was tohu and bohu. Tohu. There was no concept, no framework at all for the earth or for the universe. There was no preset path to even plug something into. There was nothing there, no ideal, no form for what things could be. And there was no bohu. There was no content. There was nothing to put into it anyway. So the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And, and yeah, in this passage, he kind of uses uh, the idea of waters and deep, but it's, it's the best he could do to paint a picture of utter chaos. Our minds can't fathom nothingness. Our minds can't fathom empty. That is beyond what we can comprehend. We always fill it in with something. And so the best of the author of Genesis' ability, he's creating this picture there is nothing there. You've got God and nothing. No content, no matter, no law, no order. It's just bare. Into this, God comes and God creates. And God creates in a way that you and I can never actually fully appreciate. Uh, sometimes in our English language, we get limited with our use of words. We have one word to pretty much describe this, and it's the idea of create. Uh, in Hebrew, they have two words. And interestingly enough, they both mean the same thing, create. But they have different ideas. There's the word asaw. Asaw is creating in the way that you and I can create. That's taking stuff that exists and making something kind of new from the stuff that was already there. So, for instance, in high school, I was really big into making balloon animals. It was just kind of a fun hobby of mine for a while. Uh, it was a little bit frustrating at times. You do too many twists or in the wrong spot, and the thing just pops on you. And when you're with little children, that's really tragic. So you have to be careful with that. Basically, I would take this long stretch of hollowed-out latex, pump some air into it, tie it off, and if I can get all the twists right, I could take the air in the latex and turn it into a balloon draft or something of that nature. I could take from something that was and create something that was new, essentially, or something that was different than what was there before. And this is the kind of thing that you and I can engage in, a saw, creating from what is here. And the Babylonian gods, they were able to do that as well. That was just fine for them. They could take from what was there in existence, and they could create new kinds of things. But the God of the, new te the, God of the Old Testament, the God of the Israelites, did something different. That God was Barah. 
Bara is another word that just means create. It doesn't mean anything different except this. It is only ever used for God. Only ever used when God creates something. And when God creates something, he doesn't do it the way we do. It's not that we have some precedent, some kind of form that we can create something into. God creates out of pure freedom and emptiness. God creates out of his own desire to create something without precedence, something that had never existed before and had never been conceived of before. This is God's creative act. There's a Latin word from it, ex nihilo, and you know if it's in Latin, then it's important. So ex nihilo, this idea that God creates out of nothing, and from this nothingness, we have the earth. That's actually kind of the tension of Genesis. Genesis is kind of a weird story if you look at it as a narrative. It seems like there's nothing there uh, to go against. Because there's another fundamental idea, and this is that God is without peer, There is no equal to God. There is no force out in the universe which can rightfully contend with God because he's above it all. And you see it in the Genesis account. The author is very careful to make this point. He sets God above all of creation. And just to remove any doubt, he's very careful with his language. Look at verse 16. This is when God is making the sun and the moon. And this is how the author puts it. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, And the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. They did actually have a word for sun and moon. It's it's not like they just forgot the words in those moments. The greater light and the lesser light. The author of Genesis, again, knew that our tendency is to worship the created rather than the creator. So this made a lot of sense for him to put this in. If you name the sun, if you name the moon, then inevitably you're going to end up in the same problem that the other cultures did, that the Babylonians did. You treat them as deities as forces that are guiding the course of humanity and on par with the God who created them. And from the onset, this author of Genesis is saying, no, this God has no equal. I'm not even going to bother to name these things because they are part of the created order. The sun, the moon, and the stars are part of God's creation. They are no more equal to him than anything else. There is no peer for God. So that's why the story is difficult, because you've got this narrative in which God is against nothing. And that's the tension. How is God going to handle nothing, emptiness, the void? Is he going to do something about it? How is he going to bless something that doesn't exist? How is this God who is love and desires to bless things going to do so with nothing? So from this, God out of the void, out of the tohu and bohu, the formlessness and the emptiness, begins to create. And create in such a way that you and I can never fully comprehend. This is the greatness of the God of Israel. This is the God that Israel wanted to show the Babylonians, the Egyptians, everyone else in Mesopotamia, show them that this God is beyond anything they had ever dreamed of, hoped, or imagined. But the Genesis account doesn't just stop with who God is. The Genesis account also has something to say about us, who we are. And so as we look at the story of Genesis, we begin to realize that God had an aim in mind as he's setting up the created order. See, in many ways, it kind of almost seems like we get slighted. Humanity, we don't show up until the very end of the sixth day. We don't get to be there when all the other things are being put into place. But you see a direction, a trajectory. God is creating a world that is specifically designed to be a suitable environment for people. And so God, on day one, begins to set order to the nothingness. And he creates concepts. And he separates the concept of light from the concept of darkness. And he begins to put some form to what he sees around him. He separates the waters from the sky. And on the third day, he gathers the dry land and plants begin to spring up. And then in the remaining days, you begin to see the content filling in these kind of areas. And so in day four, when he separated the light and dark, now he has the sun, the moon, and the stars there to guide and light the way for whatever it is that's underneath them, to set order and to set a sense of time and a rhythm. On the fifth day, he puts in fish in the sea and birds in the sky. On the sixth day, he finishes with the plants and develops animals of all kinds. After he's done this, after he's put everything he needed on the earth, he has one final act of creation. 
And he creates Adam, ground man, people. From the dust of the earth, from creation itself, he creates the pinnacle, humanity. Humanity who in verse 27 will say bears the image of of God. And I wish we could go into that in a lot more detail. This idea of being made in the image of God has a rich history. That's more than we could do this morning. But know this, there's something distinct about humanity, something unique about people that resembles God in a way that the rest of creation can't quite. And from that, God has called us to be co-caretakers of creation co-caretakers in this world to help him in this act of creating. We can't barah like God can, but we can asah, create from the things that we see around us, be part of this world in creation, and in doing so, we get to know our creator. See, this is where things get a little bit crazy. This is where Israel would have been laughed out of town at this point in time, because Israel believes something that fundamentally no one else was ready to accept. Humanity wasn't created to be slaves to a God. Humanity was given a task, to be sure. But humanity wasn't there to provide cheap labor, to provide food. Humanity was given the opportunity to be a co-caretaker. And this is where things get crazy. While every other religion that they encountered, while every other story of creation fundamentally had humanity serving at the ill whims of the gods, in the story of Israel, God works for people. In the story of Israel, God works for people. When I say that, I don't mean some kind of employee-employer relationship. It's not that we tell God what to do. That's not what I mean at all. God works for people in a sense that a mother cares for her children, that everything that she does is for their good and for their benefit. And a lot of work gets poured into creation that has nothing to do with God explicitly, has everything to do with caring for us. And in that process, we realize that God wants to have a relationship with his creation. God has not, does not simply dwell in the stars looking onward. He has not left the building. He's not a God who doesn't care. He is a God who is intricately interested in what is happening in his created order and wants to know and be part of how humanity is existing and living in that creation. If you continue to read through into Genesis, the first three verses of chapter 2, you get this kind of interesting event on the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rests. God, who is just set up to be far beyond anything anyone can imagine, has more power than any of us can comprehend, for some reason on the seventh day, rests. Did he need it? Was he tired? <laughs> God just say, all right, I'm done. That was good. A lot of scholars think, and I agree with them, that when you rest from something, you have the ability to rejoice in it. That when you're able to step back from the work that you've done and to see it in all of its glory and splendor, you can realize that you are not a slave to the thing that you've created, but you have been part of that incredible, beautiful process of making it be. So God, on the seventh day, he rests, and he makes it holy so that humanity will rest. And humanity when they're engaged in the incredible work of being co-caretakers of creation with God, knows that it is not a slave to creation, not a slave to God, but has a valuable stake, a joyful stake in where the world is going. And through our experience in creation, we can begin to understand and love and have a relationship with our Creator. Unfortunately, as Eugene Peterson pointed out, we don't always feel like that's the case. A lot of times in this world, we feel uncreated, unformed, unfit for the world that we find ourselves in. The Israelites oftentimes felt that way when they were in foreign countries with foreign gods. We feel that way. The world is chaotic. There are evils we can't comprehend, questions we seem like we can't answer, things that are beyond our control. Do we actually fit? Do we belong in this world? And a lot of times, and sometimes Christians have been guilty of this, we just try to escape it. We just try to get away. Everything in our mind is about trying to leave this creation. But God is the one who is restoring all things to himself. And fundamentally, this is why Israel was able to say the universe is in good hands. While everyone else around them said things are pretty much horrible and that's just the way it's going to be, the Israelites said no, because our God is still creating. 
our God is still at work. Our God is in control of creation and is guiding it and has not stopped creating. So we find that God has created us to be in a specific time for a reason. And here we are in time, in an orderly environment. And sometimes we abuse this idea of time. We find ourselves in the most incredible hurries, trying to get from one place to another, squeezing seconds out of the day. And when we do that, we find that we really aren't trusting that God is the one who's in charge of creation. We're trying to take things into our own hands. But while the Genesis story is never in a hurry, it also never procrastinates because there is work to be done. And God has blessed us with this idea that we are part of creation and we work with creation, the world around us, the communities around us. Because that is the aim that God has given us. Otherwise, we'd be wandering around, not having any purpose in life. But God has assigned us to be co-caretakers of this world with him. While he's given us time, he's also given us place. Sometimes having that identity is just a hard thing in of itself. For me, in the last three years, I moved to a different place three or six different times. And when you start to do that, you start to lose a sense of place, a sense of grounding. And a lot of times we feel like that. I mean, what ultimate, where do we belong Where should we be? And in the creation story, God has given us a place. And creation is that place. As broken, as confused as everything is, we belong here. And God has us here and wants to be in relationship with us here in his creation. And in the Genesis story, we have a common story, a common heritage. We can trace what we're doing now back to the Israelite community, the people who read and understood Genesis is talking about this God of all things. And we remember that we are like them, that though we don't always feel like it, God is with us. And even while there is chaos in this world that we cannot control, God is with us. The Israelites understood that God would be with every person in every time. And for the rest of the summer, we get to see some of the Old Testament stories of how God did miraculous things, continuing his act in creation through different people in different circumstances. As God looks at the chaos around us, as God looks at the chaos in our hearts, he reminds us that he is not done creating. God is still Barah making something new, something beyond our comprehension. And from the most wretched, miserable places of our lives, he is creating something beautiful and something new. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that we have a relationship with. That is the God of the Genesis story and the God of creation. One who went through an incredible amount to reach out to us and say, you are my created be with me. And so to close this morning, I'm just going to read the Genesis story. And as I do that, I invite you to set aside some of the how questions that inevitably come up. The things that just don't quite make sense, the things that you seem like need further scientific examination, set those aside for the moment. Imagine this God who is so big that he could create everything out of nothing. A God who values humanity, that he would bring up this earth to be suitable for people. And a God who is still creating and is breaking in to this world and rejoicing in it. So I invite you to close your eyes. Think about this story. Hear the words. Realize that this God who created everything is still with us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. 
And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plant bearing seed, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water team with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the waters teem and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested. He rejoiced from all the work of creating that he had done. 